Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear and see me fine. Uh, welcome to this event, which is the Introduction to Clinical Pharmacology at St. George's University of London. My name is Lanisha. I'm the Events Officer here at St. George's, and I'm going to be the host for the event today. Uh, so the format of this event will be, um, we'll have a video, I'm going to play a video from the student support team, which will last for approximately 15 minutes. And so you'll be able to hear about our accommodation, student finance and other support services we have on offer here. Following that, we will have a course overview from the co-director of the course, um, Ian Greenwood. Um, and following that, we will hear from some current students. So we will have a live student panel. So you will hear from current students about their experiences of studying clinical pharmacology at St. George's University of London. Uh, to finish off the event, we will have a live Q&A. So any questions that you guys sent in when you registered that hadn't been answered through the information delivered through this webinar, we will use the live Q&A to answer those questions live on air. Any questions that you guys also have at that time, we will answer during our live Q&A. So during this event, we can't hear or see you. We can only communicate with you or hear from you if you send us in a question. So you guys should all have a chat box on your screen. So please do send any questions that you have in to us from now until the end of the event, and we will try to answer those as best as we can. We have at this event here members of the student support team. We also have here members of admissions, current students and academics, and a member of the student recruitment team. So we have a lot of staff and current students here so we'll hopefully be able to answer all of your questions. If for whatever reason your connection cuts out and you lose transmission, please do try to log back in. We will still be here delivering this event. In any event that you're unable to come back in, then this event is being recorded. So once it's recorded, we will upload it to our YouTube page and we will also upload it to our website on the webinars page so you can see all the content there then. Um, at the end of this event, there will be um, a short survey that will pop up on your screens. I'll be very grateful if you could just take a few minutes out to fill in that survey, just so we can have some feedback about how this event went, so we can make future improvements if needed. Okay, so that's the introduction over, and I'm going to now play the student support video for you guys, which will last approximately 15 minutes. I hope you guys enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Gavin Taylor and I'm the Head of Student Services here at St George's. Today I'm going to talk to you about some of the support services that we have for students here at St George's. Many of the services we offer are badged under our Student Centre or Student Life Centre banners and these include things like health, well-being, learning support, finance and accommodation services. Let's have a look at each of those in turn and I'll give you some highlights of each of the services as we go through. So the first place to start is uh, health. Um, and let's talk about occupational health. Now, the occupational health team are there to ensure that students and staff are fit to undertake their work or their study alongside patients. Um, and they're the ones in the application process um, who will ask you for reports about your health um, and will undertake tests and vaccinate you as necessary. OH are also there to make sure that any health conditions that might affect patient safety are appropriately managed. So they don't vanish on day one of your course. Uh, they're with you all the way through and all the way through your career, in fact, to make sure that you are healthy and okay and all right to work with patients. Now, universities will take a variety of different approaches to supporting the health of their students. Uh, you may find if you've been looking at large campus universities, they've got a health center there on campus. At St. George's, because we're an urban university, um, we work closely with our local GPs, and there are about 20 of them within about a kilometer of the St. George's campus to ensure that everyone has access to all the services that they need. Most of the local surgeries will actually come onto campus for our freshers' fair in your uh, first week, um, and they'll get everybody signed up there um, and um, accessing their services as they go through. That's how we approach um, your health while we're uh, studying. Um, moving on to look at student well-being. Um, so the, the place to start with this one is your personal tutor. So every 
student at St. George's is assigned a personal tutor from the very first day. Now, tutors have an academic role. Um, they'll be giving you some of your assessments while you're in study. Um, they also have a, a very strong pastoral one. So they're there to make sure that you're OK and succeeding um, and doing your very best right the way through. And that's a big strength of the size of St. George's. Our small size lets us offer that to everybody. And I think it's a real strength of what we do. Now, as well as your tutor and as well as the specialist staff on my team in the Student Life Center, um, St. George's has a very large for our size and very well used counseling service, um, as well as a psychiatrist in house to support students mental health. We've also got a thriving faith community for a science based university um, and a chaplaincy that looks after both the university staff and students and the staff at the NHS Trust as well. And we work closely with our students union in all kinds of different things from faith right the way through to all the different activities that they offer to make sure that there's a comprehensive network of support um, within the SU and the university and the trust next door and all the way through all around our students while they're studying with us. From well-being, let's have a look at some of the learning support that's on offer. So uh, again, universities will have different approaches to writing and study skills support, but all of them will have some. Um, here at George's, we operate an academic success center, um, and that's led by three senior lecturers who are there to really make sure that every student at St. George's does as well academically as they possibly can. Um, that includes all kinds of different things from English as a second language su uh, support through uh, writing skills um, and even uh, a level refresher catch up sessions for our graduate entry students. So if you're feeling a bit rusty in the chemistry or the stats, um, they'll get you back up to speed when you uh, start with us at George's. We also believe that we've got an ethical as well as a legal obligation to support disabled students. Now, I do get approached from time to time with students concerned that their disability uh, may be a barrier to them taking up their place in a healthcare profession. Um, so just to say from the outset, there are very few, if any, barriers uh, to disabled people enter entering the healthcare profession. There's really no barrier there. And our aim is to ensure that our support is just as rounded as possible to make sure that everybody is supported. Um, and that includes the academic dimension as well as uh, the clinical placements and other things that you'll be doing, as well as all the stuff that surrounds those things like your housing and other things as well. Now, it is worth just saying that talking to us early if you're disabled really does help us make sure that everything is in place to start supporting you from the very beginning of your studies. It can take a while to get everything up and running and in place that you need. So please do talk to us nice and early so we can make sure that everything is up and running and going. Now, it's also worth just saying that um, some students, um, about 50% of people with a specific learning difficulty, find that out at university. Um, and so we offer free assessments uh, to all students um, and free specialist support as well, if that's the situation that you might find yourself in. So let's have a look at finance. So um, I guess the, the first thing that I'd like to say here is really just to reassure you um, there are 2.5 million university students in the UK at the moment. Now, these are folk who are on the same financial footing um, as you will be when you are studying. Uh, the amounts of money involved in higher education at the moment are daunting. Uh, student loans are large. Fees look big. Um, and there's a lot to think about. But just remember, there are 2.5 million people who are managing OK on it. Um, it's not a uh, necessarily an easy thing, but it is a thing that people can do and you can do it too. And we are here to help you do it. So um, just some things to keep in mind. UK tuition fees are currently uh, £9,250. They are largely set by Parliament. Um, will we see things change in the next few years before you start? That's a possibility. Um, and we'll communicate that all the way through. But just for the moment, the data we've got, 9250. Um, Maximum maintenance loan, so this is for UK students um, who are living away from the family home in London. The maximum amount you can get in a loan from Student Finance England is £12,382 per year. Um, and also just to note that students who are undertaking training towards allied health professions, so physiotherapy, radiography, paramedic science, uh, and include, indeed our colleagues doing midwifery and nursing, um, they are also eligible for a bursary from the NHS. Um, of £5,000 per academic year as well. 
Now, if you're taking out a student loan, there are no upfront costs for attending university. So the Student Finance England or the Scottish equivalent or the Welsh equivalent or the Northern Irish equivalent will pay for your fees. Um, and everybody is guaranteed to receive that loan if they apply for it. So if you're a UK student and it's your first degree, if you're not taking a, uh, a degree, uh, an undergraduate degree for the second time, you are eligible to have it funded by government. Now, the loans that you take out, both for your tuition fees and for your maintenance costs, become repayable after graduation once you're earning more than £27,000 per year. Uh, also, just to note that tuition fee and maintenance support is available for all of the programs at St. George's, um, including graduate entry pre-registration courses. Now, you may have heard that, um, a, as an indeed I've just said, uh, that there are limited funds for uh, people who are doing a second undergraduate degree. Now, just to note that for MBBS4, for the Graduate Entry Medicine Program at George's, and the MSc Physiotherapy Program, they are exceptions to that rule. So those courses are uh, fully funded from a variety of different means um, for your studies uh, for the years that you're in. So um, do bear that in mind. Uh, also, just to add, hardship funds are available for all students. We've got a pot of money aside for students who find themselves in unexpected difficulty while they're studying, as will most places. If you find yourself in financial difficulty at any point, do just get in touch and we can help. Now, there are some things that you can start doing now. So I think we're quite early in the application process as I'm talking to you today. So there are some things to get underway with. I think the most important one of those is to get a budget together. Um, for your tuition and maintenance costs and for the amount of money that you might have coming in. Now, there are some great budgeting tools and some finance calculators available online to help you do that. You can find those by checking our website. We'll point you at uh, the, various, the various calculators or the NHS one or the um, Student Finance England one, um, or just Google them. There are loads of things out there, and you can work out within about 20 minutes of online searching just how much you're likely to have as income and how much you're, you're likely to spend uh, as a student living in London um, and let you let you work yourself out of budget for the, the years that you'll be in study. It's really important to do that. It's also a really good idea to look at other sources of funding beyond Student Finance England or the NHS. There are a huge number of trusts and charities and other organizations that are there to support students in higher education, especially those students that are doing healthcare courses. So do get out and have a look for those as well. And then lastly, a quick look at accommodation. So um, things to know there. Most undergraduate students, certainly at St. George's, live in halls of residence with us in year one and then move out into private accommodation uh, nearby in subsequent years. That's the typical pattern. Um, we own our own halls of residence, Horton Halls. It's about a mile away from the university main campus. And it houses 480 students. That's about 80% of our first year intake who live in halls of residence with us. Um, now, we guarantee places in halls uh, to our international students, uh, disabled students, and students with other welfare needs. We prioritize places for all other first-year students. That includes graduate entry medics, that includes um, master's physician associate students, that includes MSc physiotherapy students. Uh, we have great thriving communities of our graduate entry and postgrad students in halls as well. Um, our halls is for everyone. Similarly, we don't prioritize places based on postcode or distance from campus. So we are looking for folk uh, who want to get away and have a, uh, a moving out of home campus based university experience, even if they live in London already. Um, we're here for you. Uh, in terms of rent, um, to note, we benchmark our rents against uh, local private housing as well as other halls of residence. There's been a great uh, boom in the recent years of uh, private companies coming into the student residential sector uh, that has driven prices up. What we do is we make sure that we benchmark against what housing actually costs in our local area, not just what housing costs look like in higher education. Um, and we keep our rents firmly under control that way. I'd never argue seriously to anybody that uh, staying in halls of residence, even with us, was an inexpensive option. But I would argue looking against local rents, we certainly are a less expensive option in a lot of cases. And halls is an extension of our student services team and is a central part of what we do as a welfare provision. So we really are there to support everybody to uh, 
move in, start university, have a great time, really get underway with your studies um, and, and really get you off on the right foot in terms of university and on into your future career. So it's a, it's a big part of what we do. And I think Halls is a really terrific uh, opportunity and, and a really excellent thing to do in your first year. So that's largely it from me. Um, we've got some of my colleagues who are in the chat already for this webinar. So you can dive in and ask them questions. If you've got anything else that you'd like to know, um, you can contact us through the inquiries team. They'll pass on any uh, individual or complex questions and we're very, very happy to answer them. Uh, so please just ask us. Um, and a slight bonus for me, I'm aware sometimes that we don't just have future students looking at this, but we also have mums and dads uh, looking at this as well. So if you are a mum and dad watching or you want to uh, to let them know a few things if they're concerned, here are a few things that I'd like them to know as well. Um, so uh, the first of that is George's is one of the safest campuses in London per the Metropolitan Police stats. Um, we are a very safe place. We're in a very, very safe part of uh, a big city. Um, students don't behave as you'd imagine is another thing I'd like you to know. Our students typically as are many university students, our students typically are uh, in employment. Uh, they are typically involved in community activities. Um, the local community is usually very pleased to see our students coming rather than the opposite. Um, they really are a huge boon to the local area. Um, and so our students are, are not as students might normally be perceived to be. Um, universities and George's included will offer support and training to new students and don't pull any punches. We do do um, anti-racism training in our first week. We do anti-sexual violence training in our first week. We don't pull any punches about what our community is about um, or what sort of profession that folks are trying to get into. So um, that will happen in the first week to keep everybody safe, to introduce them to community and really get them thinking about what's going to come ahead. Um, we usually can't talk to you without um, the student directly requesting. Um, and lastly, having the talk, and I don't mean that talk, I mean a talk about finances is hugely invaluable and really, really is probably the best thing that you can do for a student before they get off to university. Anyway, that's my time. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, again, there are folk available for questions in the chat um, and we're available really from now until you start and right the way through if you've got to ask us. My name's Gavin Taylor. Thank you very much uh, for uh, coming to see, to see us today, us today online, online. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that um, student support video from Gavin Taylor. Uh, very, very informative. Um, as he said, if you do have any questions about any student support services, please do send them in the chat um, and we'll have the team there on hand to answer those questions for you. So now we're gonna move over to the next session, which is gonna be the course overview delivered by co-director Ian Greenwood. Uh, so could I ask Ian to join us on screen? In just a moment, guys. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, hi Ian. We can hear hi. you, but we can't see you. You can't see me? That's great. Sorry, I had technological issues. The headset did not work. Can you see me now? <laughs> we can see you now. Hi Ian. <laughs> hi there, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, 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 good. Right, I have to work out how to um, share my screen. Thank you. Here we go. So uh, let me know if everyone can see this. Uh, can everyone see the presentation okay? Yeah, we can see that fine, Ian. Thank Fabulous. you. Thank you very much, everyone. So for, apologies for the technical um, disaster just then. Uh, this is the trouble with COVID. You, you try numerous things or, or lockdown and all that. You try a headset. It works every other time. And then when you come to really need it, that headset packs up. Anyway, I'm talking now. So welcome everyone tuning in. 
My name is Professor Ian Greenwood, as it says here on the screen, and I am the Professor of Vascular Pharmacology here at St George's. Uh, I've worked here 26 years, uh, both as a researcher and as an educationist, but I'm not here today to talk about uh, my research activities or anything like that. I'm here to talk to you as the co-creator and co-director of the BSc in Clinical Pharmacology, which, as this slide tells you, is the UK's only undergraduate degree in clinical pharmacology. Now, uh, this course was created by myself, along with the present uh, course director, Professor Emma Baker. Uh, she's a clinician, I'm a fundamental scientist, and there's lots of reasons why we built this course and why it's unique, which hopefully I will cover in the next uh, few minutes. But I'd just like to say, why are we looking at this odd picture of um, strange looking people behind screens uh, in the middle of the slide? And that's because these are our now third year, the first cohort that went through, that through their training and experience in this degree, were able to run the um, uh, testing centre this time last year for the benefit of all the students. So this just gives you a flavour of how wonderful our students are. So in this um, brief presentation, I'm going to tell you what clinical pharmacology is, why you should really think about doing this degree and give you some idea of the makeup of the course and how we deliver all our teaching activities. And then finally, and some might say even more importantly, what next after this degree? What careers are open to me studying this degree? And as it says here in the box, and Anisha will have already have said, if you have any questions, please type them in the box and I will be able to answer them if I can see them. Or we have four representatives from our, from our final uh, year, our first ever cohort going through, who will also be able to answer this course. Uh, these questions, sorry. So we have just been through, or are still living through, an amazing time. An amazing time because of the COVID-19 pandemic that was a global disaster story. And what scientific advances helped us to get through the pandemic, to help us to cope, to help us to have some sort of semblance of normal life. So I'm not going to open this up to the audience because of the, the format that we're in. But this is where in a lecture theatre or in one of our workshops, I would be asking you these type of questions. So have a little think about it. Because the answer really is that the scientific understanding allowed us to develop vaccines and to develop medications that has helped us to get through this awful pandemic. The development of vaccines required insight about the disease, insight to how the, the virus causes all the problems you see. Then it needed to be developed, to be validated, to go through clinical trials, and then to be determined to be statistically relevant and to be safe. All of these things are clinical pharmacology. Same with all the other drugs that are being developed at the moment. Some of you might have heard of something called dexamethasone, which is an anti-inflammatory drug commonly prescribed to many people. And our understanding at how the virus works and how it causes the body to be affected allows the development of dexamethasone for treatment for various people suffering from the COVID-19 infection. So this, in a nutshell, is what clinical pharmacology is. Clinical pharmacology is the science of developing new medicines for use in healthcare, but at the broadest level. So we've created um, a degree based upon our initial thoughts of this circular process, where each of the balls informs all the other balls, not just in this linear manner, but actually these balls can crisscross. So you could start at the top here by understanding disease mechanisms, not just uh, the COVID-19 um, 
pandemic, but any disease, heart failure, uh, pain, schizophrenia, anything. So understanding that the underlying mechanisms informs us on the discovery of new drugs, new therapies, new ways of treating these diseases. And these are then pushed through a preclinical study and then first in human, leading to extensive clinical trials that work out if things are effective, if they're safe, and if they're better than any other medications around. So you look at the economics. And finally, they appear in, in humans, and this, to some extent, all of these data then inform our understanding of the disease process. So clinical pharmacology is very much contemporary. It's very much now. It's very much relevant. And where does it fit in in the wide spectrum of different degree courses? The way the course has been put together, and you could say by the two people that sort of started it, Emma, a clinician, and myself, a fundamental scientist, it straddles healthcare and science. You will get both aspects of this, um, this broad spectrum. You will get the mechanistic insight. You will get the applied and translatable understanding. So here we have a little breakdown where at its uh, um, most uh, narrow form, you have pharmacology, studying on how drugs work in an isolated system. And then you have pharmacy, the prescription of drugs, and then you have the sort of middle ground where medicine can straddle many areas. And clinical pharmacology very much lies in this area here, understanding how drugs work, understanding how the body handles drugs, understanding how they're applied in the general population. So our goal has always been to develop graduates who are ready for work or further study in drug development and healthcare. And you're gonna see, uh, as I go through this talk, that this is not a narrow aspiration. The whole world of clinical pharmacology is incredibly broad. How did we come up with this statement? Well, before we started to construct the degree content and the delivery mechanisms, Emma and I had various conversations with different people from the pharmaceutical industry, both large pharmaceutical companies like um, AstraZeneca or GlaxoSmithKline, as well as small independent uh, biotechnology companies, clinical research organizations. And all of them articulated that most graduates arrive with a degree of knowledge but are usually lacking in various transferable skills, including numeracy, comfortable with the comfort with calculations, presentation skills, discussing skills, negotiation skills. So the way that we've built our course not only instills in you uh, considerable knowledge about the topics that we cover, but also builds uh, skills that will be transferable to any uh, career that you so choose. So how is the course put together? <clears throat> it's a three-year course, though there is always the option of spending a year working uh, in an industrial setting, and we will help you to try and get um, industrial experience uh, for a year uh, through our contacts. And we have two of our third years who are actually out doing industrial placements right now. So as I say, our course started in 2019, and so our first cohort are in their final year, which is the first time we've ever run it. So uh, St. George's is broken down into two semesters, semester A and semester B. Semester A starts in late September, semester B starts in early February. And the way the course is run is that year one, you have an introduction to all the different aspects that we go through and then there's a, a, a mini project uh, where you go through as a small team to put something together. And then you start on two semesters worth of drug targets, one in year one and in year two. And the reason why we say it like this is that we don't go through systems. We really focus on the drugs and then learn the information uh, to help us understand those drugs. So, for instance, the first week of semester B is anti-inflammatories and we go through the different drugs that are known as anti-inflammatories 
But to do this, we need to understand what inflammation is. That's the mechanistic fundamental science side. But also we need to understand how anti-inflammatories are used within the population, within the healthcare, how the NHS sees inflammation and how it's treated, how anti-inflammatories are developed, and all the sort of trials data that backs that up. This goes on all the way through until the halfway point of year two. Then we stop the sort of uh, teaching aspects and students will then start a six week research project. We do this in year two because it allows us to see if any students are really interested in the project and would be interested in doing any summer work here at St George's or may be interested even at this early stage in doing further study so we can put plans in place to try and get masters or PhD proposals uh, put together for the students when they graduate. After their six weeks project, and I'll come on to assessment in a minute, they will then spend six weeks in an industrial work experience setting. The idea here is to give every one of you on the, the, the second year experience of a work environment. It might be a pharmaceutical company, contract research company, clinical trials company, or it might be a bioanalytical company or a medical publications company. Irrespective of the source of um, work experience, you will be seeing behind what it takes to be working in a pharmacological uh, work uh, environment. You then enter um, year three. And in year three, the first semester, you will start off with uh, a hot topics module, all students will do this, and a written report, uh, written uh, writing project that all students will do. The hot topics module shown here, you will be looking at contemporary treatments of different diseases. Uh, I lead this module and I've called these weeks what's new in. So we have what's new in oncology, what's new in cardiovascular medicine, what's new in inflammation, etc. etc. So here we're talking about the most contemporary drug therapies developed or in development. And at the same time, we'll also be talking about other concepts like uh, ethnicity in drug development, the use of genetics, drug repurposing, et cetera, et cetera. And in the final semester, you will choose three advanced modules from six optional ones. This degree is unique in that instead of, have, instead of having chunks of learning that run sequentially, these chunks of learning are called modules, this is how most degrees do that. You will do one module that leads into another module. We have six modules running along at the same time. We have fundamentals of science, which is the mechanisms behind how a body works and how it can go wrong. We have pharmacodynamics, which is how drugs work. Pharmacokinetics, how the body handles drugs and how this changes in different situations, be it age or uh, kidney failure or drug-drug interactions. We then have drug development module, including all the regulations and ethics behind drug development, drugs in healthcare, how they use, how they're handled and all the regulations associated with it, and data interpretation and statistics. And the beautiful thing about this is that they all interlock. So we have a, a curriculum that Emma likes to think as toothpaste and I like to think of as lamb stew. The point being that with a lamb stew or toothpaste, you have these modules going along at the same time. So we have multicolored curricula that you see here. The reason why I think of it as a lamb stew is that some weeks you might have more of one module than another, more lamb than, say, potato, but you've always got the combination going throughout the weeks. And this extends through the first three semesters and then reappears in year two through the hot topics. and then. In the final semester, you will choose three of these six strands to focus your activities on. How do we deliver the course and how do you acquire these skills? You will be doing uh, laboratory sessions, both uh, uh, scientific bench-based studies here or clinical trials, learning different clinical skills. You will be doing data management, lots of the practicals you will be generating data, which you then interpret in the data and statistics module later in the week. You will be doing lots of presentations, 
both within a small group, then as a, a team presenting to the rest of the cohort. So there's lots of uh, emphasis on teamwork and building individual skills. And while this is going along, you'll be developing a skills portfolio that shows that you can do all these different attributes. So the skills are developed by doing alternate week clinical and laboratory practicals that extends through year one and year two. You obviously have your research project in semester B of year two. And every week you have a small group called a hub group where you will be with your personal tutor. You will do a little assessment based on the previous week's material to make sure that you're comfortable with your learning, but also you will do different skills. In week one, you will do a simple presentation, just reading out about a common drug. A couple of weeks later, you will have to put together a two slide PowerPoint presentation about a common drug. You will do calculations, you will do uh, paper investigations, you do critical appraisals, you will do um, more data interpretation, you would do more presentations, and ending up here at the end of semester one with a team based challenge, uh, small groups fighting against other small groups, where you will have present the validity and worthiness of a drug to a team of dragons that in the first year represented were represented by uh, the principal of St George's, the Dean of Education and two people from industry. To keep on learning and helping with your uh, presentation skills, we then put you on a um, presentation skills course with a wonderful actress called Molly who will help you to gain confidence in presenting so that you become a smooth and articulate beast. Presentations are how your um, research projects are assessed you will do a short report and then give a presentation about your research project. And you'll also give a presentation uh, to uh, let us know how your work placement went. And you will also do presentations, clinical skills, communication skills and data skills, as well as your writing skills in the first half of your final year. And then at uh, the midway point, a couple of weeks time, your portfolio will be signed off. So how do we go about teaching you all these wonderful things? Well, we have interactive lectures. In a minute, you will see a quote about how we coped with COVID from the Minister for Universities. But we, as a course, decided not to just flop out one hour long lectures, but we all chose to do short 15 to 20 minute podcasts with questions and teaser uh, commentaries in between the material. So our students didn't get bored at home and we've used this sort of learning mentality uh, onto our sessions now that the students are back live. So we have live lectures, we have workshops. Here you can see them learning some clinical skills but also we use this sort of format where you have a presenter who then asks challenges uh, to different groups and the students huddle together and try and work out what's going on or the different challenges and then feedback to the presenter. We have lots of data handling. We have something called drug-based learning. Here at the end of the week, students are given a scenario and they learn about the wide world of clinical pharmacology through these scenarios. We have the hub, which I've just mentioned to you, where students would uh, be with their personal tutor every week. Uh, hub groups, about eight students, and they will do lots of transferable skills like presentations uh, debating, team building, calculations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also, we have our lab-based practical. Here is a spectrophotometry one with our first ever um, set of first years, and also clinical skills. So, as mentioned, how did we cope with COVID? Uh, Michelle Donnellan, the UK government's minister for uh, universities, name checked and pointed out that St George in London is using everything from podcasts to interactive quizzes to tailor their pharmacology program to students online. So this is our um, intranet, our learning program platform called uh, Canvas, and uh, I won't go into it uh, so much now, but we coped with COVID spectacularly well. Our students stated how well they were looked after and how they felt involved. And we used lots of the technology. Uh, as you can see here, we had small group sessions. This is uh, Dr. Ng's uh, um, uh, hub group and they were all able to present and interact using um, video conferencing. And we also coped with COVID by having 
our president second years at the time, run our laminar flow testing centre here at St George's. So our students actually ran the centre where every single student who wanted to go home for Christmas was able to get um, a, a laminar flow test, uh, this fast testing system that we are all very used to, but our students actually ran the centre, did the testing, did the analysis, and also logged all the data. So we had lots of statistics about how many students were showing positive results, negative results, how many times the tests fail, that we were able to pass on to the makers. So coming to the end of the presentation now, how about assessment? I know a lot of you are like, how do I get assessed? Well, year one is doesn't contribute anything to the degree, it's a progression year only. And the way that we assess you is that you have Exams at the end of the year, there will be two exams. One exam will cover a half of the six modules and the other exam will cover the other three modules. And then there's an in-course assessment. And that in-course assessment is made, taken mainly from the weekly quizzes that you'll do in your personal group to group. The interesting thing is we have these six modules and you have to pass every one of those six modules. So while you're doing those quizzes, we will be collecting the marks for each module and letting you know how it's going along and how you're um, doing well in each module. So we have, um, uh, in year two, you have exams at the end of semester one, allows you to focus on your project, which is assessed by an oral communication and a little written report. and um, than the industrial experience. And in year three, you have uh, an in-course assessment to do with the mandatory modules and then exams just after Christmas. And that allows you to clear those modules out of the way and focus on the three final modules and you will be assessed by exams. So how are you supported? We have a diverse uh, delivery team. These in yellow are our new lecturers that we have on board. We have uh, members of staff from all walks of life, clinicians such as Emma, uh, Dagan here, uh, Henry Falk, uh, Dr. Ung. Uh, we also have fundamental scientists like myself, Dr. Priest, Dr. Stott. Uh, we have people that have spent 30 odd years in the pharmaceutical industry working for Janssen, uh, uh, all sorts of experience. And as I say, you see your personal tutor every week. Uh, you'll have these DBO sessions with a different tutor. Uh, lots of people there for you to lean on, as well as the university support systems. Careers. So where next after our degree? Well, as you can see here, there are lots and lots of exit points. Because of the variety and the involved nature of our course, you will be able to, to consider um, graduate entry degrees into medicine or physician's associate. You can go into graduate apprenticeships can consider doing masters or even PhDs. We have, uh, I think, four of our present final years who are considering and applying for PhDs, and you can go into employment. And what type of jobs can you work in? Well, there's everything from laboratory scientists, uh, drug discovery, target validation, regulatory officers, trial monitors, data managers, clinical research associate, marketing and sales, pharmacometrician, genomics analysis, uh, publication, scientific communications, it's a very broad area and you will have evidence that you are competent in all these areas. So it's been designed and delivered with the input from employees. I mentioned that uh, all, all second years spend time, uh, six weeks with uh, various industrial settings. And these are the various companies that looked after our first ever um, cohort who did it this March. So we have uh, Richmond Pharmaceutical, Pharmacology, Takeda, Niche Science and Technology, Boyd's, Eurofins, Diagnostic Company, Nova North, et cetera, et cetera. You will be work ready. Look at all the different work uh, applicable activities you'll be doing. And all the way through, you'll be gaining the, the skills that are then accumulated in a portfolio. And we sign you off by giving you badges, theoretical badges in your portfolio to show that you've had work experience, that you've done clinical trials, that you've taken part in a pharmacology skills festival, that you understand how to be COVID safe, uh, that you've done laboratory skills, presentation skills. You will be able to have summer internships in the laboratory because of your uh, research project being in the second year. 
we have had students, uh, 12 students presented at the annual meeting of the British Pharmacological Society. Two students have got their names on research papers. There's a possibility of professional training year and you have all these recognition. So finally, entry requirements. These are all there, apply through UCAS um, institution code and course code. The entry requirements are, are, th are three Bs, including biology or chemistry. And all this can be found on our website. And what we're looking for uh, is someone with passion and insight. The course strap line is motivated by curiosity. And that's indeed what we want, people that are motivated to be curious. So uh, any questions before I close down? Uh, Lanisha, over to you. Would you like me to close down now or take any questions? Hi, Ian. Thank you. That was great. Um, yes, what we'll do, we'll save any questions to the live Q&A, which we'll have momentarily. Um, thank you so much for that. That was really informative. Um, okay. Great information there. Um, I will stop sharing now then. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one thing I'll just add right now um, is the for those that are here and those that watch this later, is the UCAS deadline has changed for those applying for 2022 entry. So it usually is the 15th of January, um, but for those applying to start in 2022 September, they have extended the deadline and the deadline now is the 26th of January. So you have a bit more time to apply to one of our wonderful courses and especially clinical pharmacology. All right, so now we're gonna to move to our next session, which is gonna be our live student panel. So could I please ask our students to um, come on screen? Awesome. Thank you, okay, so um, we're going to go into our live student panel, which is where you'll hear from our current students, um, and they will tell you a bit about life at St. George's. So uh, to start with, we will first hear from, I think we're, there we go, we're going to start with Ikari first. Can you guys all see my screen? Yep, we can. Excellent. Okay, Ikari, over to you. Hi, um, hi, my name is Ikri. I'm a third year clinical pharmacology student and I'm originally from Myanmar. Um, I think in my three years on the course, I think my favorite thing has definitely been the um, asymptomatic testing center. So Professor Greenwood did talk about it, but um, I think it was a really special and unique opportunity and I'm really glad that I got to be a part of it. So when we were doing the testing center, our responsibilities included taking, processing, and recording the results of samples. And we had to make sure that all the surfaces were clean, just so that we have a level of sanitation that's always present. But a close second favorite would definitely have to be Dragon's Den, um, as previously mentioned as well, where we each have group of about eight or nine people got assigned a drug, and we basically had to convince the panel of judges or dragons why our drug should be chosen by the NHS to be funded. And also helps that my health group ended up winning. Yay. But besides that, um, I think something really good about being at St. George's that I've really enjoyed was being at Paul's, our um, accommodation. So as I'm an international student, I didn't really have any other option to stay for first year except Paul's, uh, but I ended up liking it so much that even and now that I'm in my third year, I'm still living in halls. I think a really good feature about it is that most blocks have little common rooms where you can socialize with other people from different floors, or there is also a main common room that has TV, couches, and ping pong tables as well. So I highly recommend staying. Hi everyone, so my name is Maisha Zainab and I'm also a third year clinical pharmacology student. Um, I live in East London, so I commute to university every day. I chose to study at St. George's because it's a small healthcare focused university and I didn't think I would be able to have that specific experience anywhere else. 
So some of the highlights of my studying here at St. George's also include Dragon's Den. So I have a picture of the trophy that Ekery won. Um, another highlight was definitely working at the COVID testing center. And it was just a really cool experience because in first year, although you do have clinical skills sessions where you sort of pretend to be talking to patients, it was a really good experience for me to actually speak to people and be able to practice talking to patients, sort of making sure that you're not using jargon, making sure that you're communicating carefully and explaining what they need to do. And the big picture I have is um, a sort of summary of my work experience. So as Prof Greenwood said, in second year, you get to do a six week work experience placement. And I did mine at Kyoa Kirin, which is a Japan based international pharmaceutical company. And it was very interesting um, because I had never sort of considered really going into the pharma industry. I thought that I would stay in research, but it was so interesting to be able to meet lots of different people and see how many different um, pathways that are available. So I got to meet people who were working in marketing, people who were working in post-market authorization, people working in patient advocacy or medical information. So all these sort of different things that I didn't know about. Um, we were also given the opportunity to do some um, competitive intelligence tasks. So for example, Kiowa Kirin is developing some drugs. So we were asked to look at other drugs on the market so that they can see how they would make their drug um, obviously more, um, how they would make their drug um, unique in order to be able to sell it to payers and make sure that it actually impacts patients. Um, so that was a really cool experience for me as well. So hi everyone, my name is Mary Therese and I'm also in my third and final year of clinical pharmacology. So um, I'm originally from Germany, but I moved to Croydon, which is in South London, around 10 years ago. So um, in my first year, I also lived in halls like Ikari did. And then in my second year, I decided to move out with some friends from the university. And now in my final year, I'm commuting to university. So I chose to study at St. George's because I knew the university quite well from having been to some summer schools previously. And I'd also done some work experience at the hospital before, so I knew it quite well. Um, and since having joined St. George's, I've tried out various different clubs and I decided to stay with Women's Rugby and with the Musical Society. And it's great that I could still perform because when I was at school, I used to always perform in musicals. So it's great that I could continue that at St. George's. And it was also really good that I could try something completely new. So I had never done, and I've never played rugby before joining university. So it was just great trying something completely new and then actually really loving it. And some of my like closest friends at St. George's are actually from these societies. So I really encourage everyone to join some different societies when joining university because you don't know what you might like and what people you might meet there. So it's really been a great experience for me. Hi everyone, I'm Rada. Um, unfortunately, I've had some technological issues, so my webcam isn't working, which is why I've stuck a picture of myself um, on the slides. Um, so I'm originally from London and I'm also in my final year at St. George's. Um, the reason as to why I chose St. George's was because it's the only um, university in the UK um, which has a campus base within the hospital. Um, I found that being immersed within a professional healthcare environment really appealed to me. And I think, you know, it's important at the end of the day to really get that professional mind working, I guess, in terms of once you graduate and go into the working world. Um, so in terms of a key highlight for me um, in the past three years would be working at the COVID testing centre. Um, I've inserted a picture of myself in the scrubs that we had to wear. Um, for me, it was a really great opportunity, I feel like, as we were able to help out in a time when um, a lot of things were going on in terms of healthcare, um, loads of uh, people were struggling and things like that. And it made me envision just how important kind of um, being able to help everyone out at times when we can. Um, but also, I think once um, when I when I started um, out um, 
in first year uh, and Clinton Farm. I didn't really know much about what it was, but I think through COVID, I've been able to um, understand just how much of an up and coming field that clinical pharmacology is, uh, is and how important it is. Um, so in terms of second year, um, as mentioned by um, the others, um, we had a placement uh, for six weeks. I did my placement at Niche Science and Technology. And I think being able to go on placement was such a star aspect of our course as um, rather than having to take out a complete new year to undergo placement experience, we actually got to do it within our degree. And I think that's so important as it gives us a flavor of the working world. And I really enjoyed it as a, I wasn't really familiar with like the pharma industry before. And by undergoing placement, I was able to learn a lot more about it. And also just, I guess, work out how things work within the pharmaceutical world. Um, in terms of like the social life within uni, um, it's honestly brilliant. Um, there's the student union um, has plenty of opportunities um, for all of the students to attend events. And um, we, I actually um, inserted a picture of the boat party um, that we had back in first year. And it was a really great experience. Um, I think in terms of what surprised me, I would say is that the community feel within our uni is so brilliant. Um, everyone knows everyone, which is really lovely. And it's great to see kind of familiar faces when you're on your way to lectures or grabbing a bite to eat. So to conclude, I say that the course team are absolutely brilliant and they're really there to support you and always um, structure the course so that we're motivated by curiosity, but also we're able to prepare ourselves for the working world as well. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed hearing from our current students. I, I sure did. Um, so we're going to go into our final session of this webinar, which is going to be our live Q&A. Um, before we start that, could I please ask for Ian Greenwood, co-director, to please join us back on the screen? Here I am. Hello, Ian. Hello. Thank you for joining us. And weren't um, those students amazing? They, in my opinion, they sure were. They're amazing. They were they were complete jellies before they arrived, and now look at them. They are amazing. <laughs> awesome. Um, so we've got a few questions um, to answer. Um, first of all, I am going to. Uh, get the questions which were sent in with um, our audience's registrations. There are a few questions still outstanding or that haven't fully been answered or I just want us to clarify to make sure that their uh, questions have been answered. Uh, so the first one which was repeated a few times was can you become a pharmacist with this degree or is this a route to become a pharmacist? No and no. To be a pharmacist, you have to be uh, registered by the Royal Pharmaceutical Council uh, and the pharmacy is a four year degree um, and there are specialist schools of pharmacy that, that address things very different ways. Pharmacy is the is effectively the, the prescription of drugs and, and how you get into it. In essence, our clinical pharmacology degree covers everything that wraps around the prescribing of drugs. So how do you get a develop a drug, how do you go through the trials process, how do you get the regulation, the ethics, and then how do you monitor that a drug's safe when it's in the, in the, in the community, how individuals respond differently to medicines, how um, a drug changes depending on the state of that individual, be it drug-drug interactions, uh, or age, or disease, or those type of things. So it is not a route into pharmacy, though of course because you're going to be so well trained, you will be very, very competent to get onto a pharmacy degree, but you would be starting as an undergraduate on that pharmacy degree. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, and another one for you, Ian, before we go on to some questions that our students can answer is, um, can you change career paths with this degree? Um, um, you can always change career paths. I don't quite know what they mean by that, but. Uh, uh, once you start on a career, you can, you can always change. Uh, I was going to do environmental biology 30 years ago, and look at me now. Um, so, uh, but in terms of like these guys here, they have so many options 
that they could contemplate. It's a little bit like showing them a range of chocolates and they've all tasted the different flavours and they've all got different flavours they like, but no doors are closed to them uh, at this moment in time. So in, if that answers that person's questions, then, then fine. And if not, maybe they could type back and I could help them explain a little bit more. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. Um, and another question here is, um, what sort of work experience is required for this course when applying? And what work experiences did you have as current students? So is work experience required when applying for clinical pharmacology? Uh, I'll ask this in the past to students. Um, no, it's not. We don't really consider work experience beforehand. Uh, we really are, we do tend to operate by our core strap line is that we want students that are motivated to be curious. And all of these guys here uh, are, are curious people. They want to know why, how, what, when, whatever. Uh, I also noticed one of the last questions came up about an interview. We don't interview for the clinical pharmacology course. We uh, take students as they are, and then hopefully we will be able to allow them to shape and develop as the course progresses. So no, no specific work experience, no interview. We just want people that are very curious about the world uh, or, of the human body and drugs related to it. Uh, over to the students. So, so let's turn it around then. So students, um, how did anything that you did beforehand set you up for this course in retrospect? Was there anything that you did before that made it a bit easier for you? Um, I definitely think that my A-level subjects did help me. So like doing chemistry at, at A-level, like I think that was helpful because you're kind of used to being in a lab. Obviously the labs at St. George's are much better than what we had at school. But um, it does kind of, you know, help you get into that mindset of what it's going to be like. So I do think that helped. I don't think any specific like, work experience is required. OK, thank you for that. Um, somebody has asked, how many days a week do you study on this course? Over to the students. I'm always studying. <laughs> Um, uh, Maisha, how, how long do you spend on, on the course then? Let's start with you as you're in the bottom of my screen. In Currently in third year. Uh, um, let's say first year if you can remember. For... I can't, I think it was four or five days, but we did always have one morning off and Wednesday afternoon off. Um, I think in first year, first semester was a lot less sort of vigorous as the course continues on, it gets a bit more difficult. But I do think that um, yeah, I did have quite a bit of free time and um, it kind of depends on how you study. So, for example, um, one thing that I do is during lectures, I do type up the majority of my notes or what I will do is. So, for example, if we're learning about a new um, topic, I will create like a, um, a table and it will have like keywords. And because I've sort of already done the half the process of like how I will write my notes up, that kind of helped me reduce the amount of time that I was spending going over lectures. Um, yeah. Uh, anyone else? And um, Farada, uh, what do you think about the workload for the, let's say, the first year? Um, I think I completely agree with Maisha. I think in terms of kind of um, as we go on through the degree, the workload obviously intensifies. Um, but I think, yeah, first year, like, because um, we were obviously settling in with kind of university life and um, just, I guess, lectures in general. Um, I'd say it was a reasonable amount in the sense that it was manageable, but you could also have time off to try out new societies and also enjoy the social life. But I think in terms of even now, third year, we still have time to do other things. So it's not too like overloaded with work to the point where, you know, you can't really enjoy anything else, which I think is nice to have a balance between work and social life as well. If I could add on to what Verada said. I think one thing that's really well done with this course is that it's been structured really well. So um, I think Prof Greenwood was saying before how we will always have exams um, in the right place. So for example, in second year, you'll have your exams before you start your research project. So you can study, you can do the exam, you can get that over and done with. There will never be a sort of overlap of, oh, I have these two different modules I have to study at the same time, 
or I have to do an essay and I have to revise for an exam, it will always be sort of separate and it will give you that amount of time so you can um, schedule time for you to study. Thank you. No, thank you for that. Um, somebody has asked if the course can be studied part time. No. Excellent. Thank you. That's it's a straight a, it, Sorry, let me just clarify that. It's a very involved course that starts the week in year one with a small group session where you do a weekly quiz that helps students to sort of just keep on top of their material. It's not a tricky quiz really, but you know, you just get used to going through your material. Then you do some sort of transferable skill. Then in the afternoon you do a practical and quite often that practical generates data that you'll analyze later in the week. Then you'll have lectures or workshops. Then you'll have um, some data interpretation statistics um, workshops. And then at the end of the week, you'll have drug based learning that gives you some more cues and some more insights. So that's rolling along all the time. And it's it, there's, there's really no way that you could bite or nibble at that type of um, uh, it's not an intense curriculum, but it's very involved. Lots of collisions of different types and mixing of people. Okay, okay, thank you. Can you go straight from a BSc to a laboratory job or is a PhD or MSci necessary? Um, you can indeed go from uh, this course or any degree really, but this course, if you, you you can get a job in a laboratory, you can get a job in a drug company, you can get a job in a clinical research organization, you can enter as a BSc. It is not mandatory to have a master's or a PhD. What those two things give you is potentially um, the ability to rise quicker through an organization. The converse argument though is that having studied for four years for a PhD, you have a certain way of thinking that then drug companies have to try and change to match their way they operate. So quite often drug companies prefer to have graduates because they can shape them easier. Okay. Do we accept students with a second degree uh, from the UK in a non-science subject, for example, having a master's degree in international politics? Um, off the top of my head, I, I think we'd really need to look at the uh, CV of that person. So uh, I suggest they uh, contact us and we can um, explore it. We, we, we try not to say no to anyone. Okay. And another question is, do you have any wider reading recommendations? I'm going to ask that. I'm going to hand that over to the students. <laughs> I'd say Rang and Dale will become your best friend if you join the course. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think just like the news as well, there's a lot going on in terms of pharmacology, like especially with the COVID vaccines and um, also like the pharmaceutical industry in general. But I think just like topping your news, like your uh, knowledge up with like the news, I guess, would be a good place to start. Uh, if you chose to come to this course and were offered a place, uh, we would not give you any pre-reading to do. Uh, there's enough stimulation throughout the course and uh, springboard points uh, as you get going to, uh, say, to, to satisfy any inquiring mind. So no, there's nothing in advance. As I say, really, it's that motivation to find out how, why, what uh, happens and how these things work rather than just following a script. Okay. Uh, can you work part-time while studying this degree? I think many of our students, the, the four present, might all have part-time jobs. I know of one of my tutees who definitely does. Um, Mary Therese, do you have a part-time job? Does anyone have a part-time job? Um, no, I only usually work um, like in the holidays, like in, in the summer holidays, like I did an internship. Um, but I do think if you come to St. George's, definitely apply to be a student ambassador, because I think that's a great job. You can kind of just work when you want to work. So um, like you, you never feel like there's too much going on, like just whenever you're free, you can take on a job. And I think that's really a good one. Yeah. Excellent. Are but there, there are many students. mature? Sorry. Sorry. Go on, no, go on, Ian. Uh, sorry, there are students on the course who definitely have 
uh, part-time jobs in shops, in next, in cafes, uh, whatever. Um, it's just how you can juggle things, really. Okay. Sorry. Are there many mature students on the course? All of our students are mature, but you mean <laughs> are they are of a of a certain age? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, yes. So I like... suspect most of our third year, most of our third years, you're probably all um, I, I don't know what 21, 22, something like that. I don't think we have anyone much older but in year two there's definitely two that are in their 30s and in year one there's at least three in their 30s okay excellent well that is the last of our questions that we have if anyone has any last minute burning questions please do send them in now in the next minute and we'll try and get that answered for you otherwise i hope you guys have enjoyed this event and all of the content delivered from the course experts, our current students and our co-director. Um, this event is being recorded, so the video recording of this will be housed on the St George's University of London YouTube page and also on the webinars page on our main university website. If you do have any questions after this event has finished, please do email them in to study at sgul.ac.uk and our inquiries team will endeavour to get those questions answered. Um, I just thank everybody for coming today. I hope you really enjoyed the event and we look forward to hopefully seeing your applications soon and hopefully seeing you guys in the very near future at St George's. Um, so just a big thank you again to all the students and staff and all of the support staff. That are, oh, one question here just before we go. What makes a personal statement stand out for you? Wow. Um... Motivation, curiosity, desire. Um, I, I don't know really, uh, to be honest. Um, I don't know. Sorry, that's rather vague. Um, um, we tend to just really work with what we get presented with, and the students then work with the course. It's 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 a bit more organic than working really off the off the personal statement. I would just show an enthusiasm for. Uh, drug development, uh, drug actions, medicines uh, in general, and and um, we'll go from there. Excellent. Thank you very much. And a final question, which I know you already covered in your talk, but I guess let's answer it one more time just for clarity. Can you go into medicine after um, obtaining this degree? You can. You can go into graduate uh, uh, entry medicine which is a four-year degree. We have one at St George's. There's a few across the country. You also always obviously go into undergraduate medicine. And what I would say, and hopefully our students would agree, is that you will be extremely competitive because of all the different things you've done, not just your level of knowledge, but the fact that you've done clinical skills, you've been on a ward, you've been to a pharmacy unit, you understand um, drugs in the healthcare, you understand about drug development, and you've done all the clinical skills as well as presentation skills. So you these guys if any of these are applying for medicine they they will be super equipped uh for um entry into graduate medicine so it doesn't shut any doors at all excellent okay so that's the last of our questions again thank everybody for attending today thank you to our students and all of our support staff i wish you all a pleasant evening and again i look forward to hopefully seeing you all in the very near future goodbye everybody